right. Hey, let's give them a hand and say thank you for leading us in worship. So good to be with you all this morning. And we are going to continue in our Together series. Together, maximizing our minimal window. The gist of it is it's very clear from the scriptures. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior, you've been called to make disciples. It's very clear in the scriptures, not very clear according to our culture, certainly not clear to a lot of us as it applies to our level of comfort, but it's very clear from the scriptures that believers are called to make disciples. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. And so what we want to do this, throughout this series is remind us that together, uh, that's how we are maximizing our minimal window. We have a small window of time, and God has graciously drawn us to himself. We want to maximize the time, each of us making disciples. It's not something that's been regulated to pastors or to just leadership of local churches. It is for all believers. And so what we're doing the first few weeks is building a kind of a theology of togetherness. And we looked at it, it's modeled in the Trinity, the Godhead. Remember, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit working together in a unified uh, way that is unlike anything any of us ever known. You've got three persons, one essence, and they function together. We looked at uh, the spirit and how we're united. And because of the spirit, we have been united in a supernatural, relational, connected way, unthink, unlike anything that man knows about. And so this week, what we want to do is we look at the fact that together we've been redeemed and reconciled in Christ. And for us to get this, one of the key things is to recognize that before Christ and before we trusted in Jesus Christ, and some of you perhaps even this morning are at this place right now, still outside of faith and apart from God. And, and so I, I have a couple ways I want to illustrate that for us this morning. Um, so when you think of, here's where you were. You were apart. I want you to think of, we were created... Um, Adam, Eve, in the garden, perfect relationship. Sin came into the garden, Adam sinned, and so man, relationship with God was broken. Now, to represent this, um, I have these nails, and they're very hard nails. But each one of these, say they have your name on this morning. And uh, this one represents one of you and another one of you. Bad theology. Got to put that one back out. And so I, I literally have one for each of you this morning. And so you're, you're going to be outside because of sin, outside of relationship and apart from God. Does that make sense? That's where we all were. And some of you, even this morning here, you know that you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so for you, you're still outside not only are you outside, but you're apart. Now, here's what Christ did. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, he made a way for us. And he literally ran us down. And he, brings, he brought us in through his blood. And he reconciled us together. Now, there are some this morning, and I, left, I did this intentionally... There are still some outside. And even this morning, there's very likely that there are people in a room this size with this many people where there are still some who are outside and apart. There'll be people watching online who are outside and apart. But what we're going to look at, the passage we're going to look at this morning is going to teach us that in Christ, we have been brought in through his blood and we have been brought together. In Christ, I have one other way I want to illustrate this, sweetheart. Um, if you'll help me, I got my little van here this morning. It's so much fun. Um, so um, I want to take. I don't know if you knew this, but if you netched a banana and left it overnight, you can actually darken. So we have a bruised, we have a bruised banana this morning. And so what I want to do is I want to take this bruised banana, and I'm going to put that in here. And then I have in here hmm, another bruised banana and some uh, spoiled strawberries. 
and you add to the spoiled strawberries blue, some of your spoiled, some of your bruised, and some of your blue, right? And some of you. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a chance to try it. Some of you uh, bitter. You have things that God allowed happen in your life, and you were super bitter. Some of you this morning, you can't, you don't even know why, but you're cold to the things of God. And so I have, I have some ice here that represents the cold. And so we'll, we'll put a little ice in here because some of you are really cold to the things of God. In fact, probably somebody in this room outside of faith, cold to the things of God. Add to that, some of you are sour. It's not really sour. First service, some of them thought it was sour. It's really not sour, but for illustration purposes, here's what I want you to see. This is where, where we were, is we were bruised, we were bitter. We were soured, we were spoiled, we were cold. And what happened in Christ... Um, something amazing happened. Um, he did an amazing work in us. Hmm. When you put all these things together in Christ, uh, they were once apart and they were separated, and now they've been brought together. They've been brought in and brought together, redeemed and reconciled. Jamie, you want to try it? You can have it. I, I had one first service. I can tell you, here's what I want you to see, total sweetness in being bought in and brought in. The last thing I want to do to set up the passage this morning is yeah, sweetness in Jesus. Here's the thing. If you're here and you're not a believer and you want to be a part of the sweetness, recognize that you were apart and outside and he wanted to bring you in through his love and through his mercy. Paul is going to write in our, in our passage today, he's writing to a church at Ephesus. Let me share with you a few things about that. When he starts, he's writing to believers. and Some believe it was a letter to a localized church, and some believe it was a letter to the churches in Ephesus. We're not sure, but here's what he wants to show them. That he, he's speaking to the believers in Ephesus. Um, this was a large, a large city, a seaport city at the time. It was called the Gateway to Asia. It was the capital of the providence of Roman Asia. Well, it was a, a Roman providence of Asia. They had a Greek god there named Artemis, and they would worship Artemis. There was a silversmith in um, Ephesus, and they would make little images and idols of this Artemis, and they would sell them to people. And Paul spent more time, we believe, at Ephesus as recorded than anywhere else that he did ministry. So he had great fondness, love, connection. Uh, Ephesus had a, a very prominent contingency of uh, Jewish people. There was a, a large synagogue in Ephesus. They would go into this amphitheater and they would worship, they would, they would cry out, great is Artemis, their, their, their small G God. It's estimated that somewhere between 24,000 and 28,000 people could fit inside the amphitheater and they would begin to cry out to great is Artemis. If you were from Rome, they called her Diana. And so just think with me for a moment. Paul's in the city of Ephesus. It's the capital providence of Rome in Asia. So it has a large Roman influence. They're worshiping the Greek god of Artemis. So there's an incredible Greek influence. There's a large contingency of um, Jewish people. And so they have that population. I mean, you talk about a hodgepodge. And then he's taking them the message about the gospel, and he's wanting them to recognize all this diversity has become one in Christ. They've been bought in 
and brought together. There's two Greek prepositions I want to teach you this morning that are in our passage. We're going to look into in Ephesians. The first one is epsilon nu, n is how you say that, and it means in, and in the way it's going to be used in our passage today, you are in Christ. This is used over 7,500 times in the New Testament. It's not always referring to being in Christ, uh, but many times throughout the New Testament, when you hear the phrase in Christ, you are a part of all that you have, all the riches, all the connectedness, all the blessing that is yours in Christ. I sign most of the letters, most of the text I send, I will end them with in Christ, recognizing that that's who my identity is in, it's in Christ, it's where my security is, it's, it's purpose for living is in Christ. The second preposition is a sigma upsilon nu, and you say soon, soon, and it means together. What you're going to see throughout this passage that we're going to look at this morning is that we've been redeemed, bought in through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we've been put together. You were once outside and apart, but through the blood of Jesus, you have been bought in and you have been brought together. It is a really cool picture to see theologically that through the blood of Christ, we've been bought in and brought together. Now, if you're here this morning, hear me. If you're here and you're still out here because you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, as we walk through this, our prayers, God's desire would be that you would trust in his son and be bought in and brought together. Let's look at this passage together uh, with me, if you would. It's Ephesians chapter 2. And um, I want to read this guy's quote. I think you have it, Katie, from Tim Soper, this quote. He's saying about this passage that we're going to look at, and I thought it was really good. He said, we have a teacher in Paul facing his earthly demise. In other words, Paul's in prison. Um, he understands that his days are numbered. He's about to give his life as a martyr for Jesus Christ. So we have this teacher in Paul facing his earthly demise, passing on potentially final thoughts to his most prized students in the church of Ephesus. There are no more lessons to be taught, and now is the time for the student to reflect on the overarching purpose of their teaching, becoming a church created in Christ Jesus and in the glory of God. Together, redeemed, and reconciled. Paul begins his letter by writing to the church at Ephesus and reminding them how blessed they are in Christ that you've been chosen, you've been predestined, you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven, you've been lavished with the wisdom of God, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and he's just reminding the believers who they are in Christ. But he also wants them to remember that they were once outside and apart. And so he writes this in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. So he shares in this passage, essentially, we were all spiritually dead in our sins and we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's where we were. We were all separate, apart, and outside. Um, Brian, do you mind coming up? I have asked this young man if he'd read a passage to us from John, if you'd make your way up here and just stand right behind that outlet. Uh, before Ryan reads this passage from John 3, I want to remind us, it says in Romans 3 that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so we all have sinned, right? That's what we're looking at, that we were all outside and apart. And this passage in Ephesians says that we were all deserving of the wrath of God. We were by nature children of wrath. Romans 6, 23, the first part of that says the wages of sin is death. And so the wages of our sin, what we deserve for our sinful behavior, our sinful nature is death and separation from God. Romans 5, 12 tells us that wherefore, as by one man's sin, speaking about Adam's sin, Therefore, death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And the passage that 
Ryan's going to read for us. It's going to talk about this gift, for God so loved. But it's also going to talk about the reality that if you've never believed, you stand condemned. Listen to this as Ryan reads. believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son this is the verdict light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John, mm -hmm. John 3. John 3, 16 through 21. All right. Give this guy a hand. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so you see, you see the tension there. And in one hand, God so loved the world, he's given his one, one and only son. And this light has come into the world, but people choose darkness rather than a light. And that those, it says, who have not believed stand condemned already. And so what I wanted us to see, and I think this is really cool, when you, when you get this picture that we were outside and apart, and only through the love of God were we brought, bought in and brought together. There's just something really special about that particular truth. When it says that we were all spiritually dead in our sins in this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, it reminds us that we followed the ways of this world. Sexual impurity and selfishness and materialism and greed, and you go on and on. That's who we once were. Ruler, it says we also followed the rulers of the kingdom of the air. We followed Satan and his ways and his wants and his will. The third thing it reminds us is that we followed the cravings and the gratifying of our flesh. We followed um, all kind of things that were outside of bounds that were cravings from our own flesh. As a result of our nature... Um, being separate and outside, we were by nature, it says, deserving of wrath. Now, all of you should have got a handout. Did everybody have a handout? If you didn't get a handout, raise your hand. If you didn't get a handout, oh my goodness, how did that happen? Who has the handouts? How did that happen? Uh, so we're going to have you make sure you have a writing utensil and a handout because we want to walk you through this and make sure that you have this handout. Um, I'm going to read the passage. And I want you to pay close attention to the passage. And we're going to see how God brought us in and how he brought us together. You're going to see these two words. You're not really going to see them because they're in the Greek language. But this idea of being in and this idea of being together is throughout this. Raise your hand high if you don't have one of these up here. Caitlin and Ainsley. Up here, Steve. Up front. Yes, these two young ladies who are. How did you get in here with that one? All right. Perfect. All right, so here's what I want to do. Um, let's read the passage together. Pay close attention. Let's put it up on the screen. Will you guys uh, stand and we'll say this together? Everybody stand. Let's say it together. Ready? All right, here we go. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one could boast. All right, we're going to hold off on the last verse. You guys can have a seat. So if you take out your handout, um, at the very top, 
We've been redeemed, bought, and reconciled, brought together in Christ. So this passage comes off the heels of you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God. Here's what God did. And so when you're studying, you're looking at what words modify what other words. And so if the subject here is God, what does it say about God? Well, it tells us two things, very specific, and both are key and very important. God is rich in mercy. Anybody here glad this morning that God is rich in mercy? Yes, thank you, God. (laughs) Thank you, God. He's rich in mercy. So if you're here this morning and questioning, perhaps you're outside of relationship with God, and you're going, man, I've got too many screw-ups. My list is too long. It's not too long for the grace of God because God is rich in mercy. But not only is God rich in mercy, look at the second thing it says about God. It says, because of his great love, he is going to act out of his great love. And he's doing that for you this morning. Uh, If you're outside of faith, he's working on your behalf so that you could hear the gospel and respond to it. Many of us have done that. God has already been gracious in showing his love toward us. In that first line, write this, made us alive with Christ. We were dead, right? We were dead, but he made us alive. So we were outside of faith, separate, apart, and dead spiritually, but through Christ and what he did, he made us alive. And I just want to point out that this word, made alive here, has this prefix with it. In the Greek language, you've been made alive together with Christ. You were dead, and he made you alive with Christ. Let's read on uh, you can write on those, where all those little lines are, it says, for it is by grace, you might make grace capital letters, you might circle it, but make a note of that, it is by grace you have been saved, they'll fit in those little boxes there. I want to speak about grace, just so you have this, put this on your fridge, keep it with you, something, uh, three things about grace, it's unmerited favor, so there's two little lines there at the front, unmerited favor, it's unlimited power so when you've trusted in him there's nothing that he can't help you get over or around through and then endless supply you'll never run out Uh, the scriptures teach us his grace is sufficient it's always there when you need it if you'll just draw upon it it's not like you can use up a lot of his grace one day and find there's not enough for the next day endless supply of god's grace then that next bullet point there right in raised us up The scriptures here in Ephesians tell us that God, through his son Jesus, he made us alive and he raised us up with Christ. That word soon is with this again, raised us up with Christ. The third thing, that third bullet, right, sealed us. We gave you an extra blank. You can draw a picture there if you'd like. Um, So together, we've been bought in Christ, redeemed, and we've been brought together soon This word has this prefix three times. He made us alive, he raised us up, and he seated us. And so positionally, you are already in Christ in the heavenlies. Like, it's positionally done. Now, it's working out here. We have a lot of kinks, and we're not finished. We're all not little Jesuses running around like we got it all together. We're still in process, but positionally, in God's eyes... You've already been made alive, raised, and seated in the heavenlies. And then you see that it says, in Christ, that next two-word blank. That's a big piece. That word, and in Christ. You've been bought in. And it says, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. There it is again. Now, go on. Verse 8 and 9, it's talking about, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, a gift of God so that no one should boast. So you can write in those three blanks. It is by grace you have been saved through what? Through what? Through faith. Through faith. By grace you've been saved through faith. Number one, write in not from yourselves. Reminder this morning, you can't save yourselves. You were dead. You can't resuscitate yourself. It's God who's moving on your behalf, not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Second of all, it's not by works. Don't think this morning for a moment that you can do something that can earn favor or earn salvation. It is simply a gift, not from yourselves, not by works. Verse 10 goes on to describe now what we have. We are God's handiwork. We are, not you individually, we are together, God's handiwork created in Christ. There it is again. 
to do good works which God appear, which God uh, prepared in advance for us to do. Got them all? No? What is it? Yeah? It's by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, has this happened individually? Yes. But more importantly, and what this series is about, is showing us that this has happened to us collectively. Together, we have been bought in and brought together. I wrote this, and Paul's going to highlight this, that it's uh, remembering really important truths is really important. I know you go, man, that's like, duh. Remembering really important truths is really important, like, duh. But think about this. I had a friend last week that lost his bride. She was 42 years old and had three kids. It was a tragedy, right? Just unexpected, out of the blue, clot to the brain, she died. It is really important that we remember really important truths. And he did. At, at Jennifer's funeral, he said, we were pretty young. We didn't talk about our funerals a lot, what that might look like. But one thing we discussed that should one of us die, we'd want to make sure that the other would share the gospel. And so here this guy is, tragedy strikes, and it's really important to remember truths because important truths, they are, they're just really important. So here he is in this moment remembering this very important truth, and in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, he said, if there's one thing Jennifer would want you to hear today, it would be the good news about Jesus Christ. See, he remembered the really important truths because remembering those truths is really important. Some of you are single, and it's important for you to remember the truths because Satan will come in and you'll start questioning, is it me? And what's the truth say? That God loves you. He's at work in your life. He wants to draw you closer to himself. He has reasons for everything that he, he does purposely or that he allows, that he's enough. And so it's important to remember these truths. Well, what Paul's going to do is he's going to say, don't forget who you were. You were outside and apart. And so he wants us to remember who we once were. Don't forget who you were before Christ. And so look what he writes. He says, therefore, this is verse 11, therefore remember that, you, that formerly you were a Gentile by birth and called uncircumcision by those who are called themselves the circumcision, that which is done by human hands. Remember. At times you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners of the covenant of the promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. In other words, don't forget who you were. You were outside and apart, and he lists them. You were separate from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship in Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope, without God. You were at a really bad place. I was at a very good place. In fact, if God doesn't intervene on our behalf and send his son and get us the gospel message, guess what? We stay outside and apart from God. And Paul's reminding them, don't forget who you were. You were outside and apart. But he goes on, don't forget who you are in Christ. You've been bought in. You've been brought together. Look at this. Verse 13. But now in Christ, there it is, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's how you've been brought in, by the blood of Jesus. He himself is our peace, who made the two groups one. And he's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And so you read that and you go, well, what? What did he destroy, this barrier, this dividing wall of hostility? What was that that he made these two groups, Jew and Gentile, one? A lot of people have a lot of thoughts about this. And I was thinking about it. I was thinking, like, most of them, I think, were right. They were, th they were saying, like, your flesh is a barrier. Yes, your flesh is a barrier. Um, your flesh, outside of God, is filled with enemy, en enmity towards God, towards other people. That's a barrier. Um, but they also had like a physical barrier. Both Jew and Gentile actually had physical barriers that were brought down. Um, the law could have been a barrier. What the law did was showed you that you couldn't save yourself. You couldn't keep it. You couldn't be righteous on your own. You needed something outside. 
I mentioned that they're both groups of people, Jew and Gentile, had barriers. And I came across this, that it said in Jerusalem, pertaining to the temple, there was twofold wall of partition. One was an inner wall, and it's what it did, it kept Jewish people from entering into the holy part of the temple where the priest officiated. Um, only priest and only high priest could go into the holy holy. Everybody else was separated. There was a wall. Can't go any further than that. But for Gentile people, there was another wall that separated the Gentiles from access into the court where even the Jews could go. Well, the point is that what Jesus did, in, and not just in Ephesus, but this is where Paul's teaching it, where you have people of Roman influence and Greek influence and Judaism influence, he's saying, no, in Christ, you have all been bought in, you've been redeemed, and you've all been reconciled. The relationships that have been strained, the relationships with the broken between God and between others have been brought together in Christ. And so he explains this. this. He says, he came, speaking about Christ here. Now let me read this. He said, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So through the cross, hostility towards one another, um, any racism, uh, any favoritism, all that should be put to death at the cross. And then he says this, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, through who? When I say through him, through who? Through Christ, get this, Talk about unity here. Get this. Through Christ, we both, who are the both in the passage, say it again, Jew and Gentile. So through him, Jew and Gentile, both of them, so um, through him, we both have access to the Father. There you see the Father by one spirit. So all this together. For through Christ, Jew and Gentile have access to the Father through the Spirit. It's all represented as this one thing that's together. And now he's going to explain. Consequently, you are no longer a foreigner or stranger, but a fellow citizen with God's people. And also a member of the household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So here's where you once were. You were all outside and apart. You were separate from Christ, secluded from the citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope, without God. Pretty bad place. But now we are fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. It's interesting, this cornerstone... I'm going to have the band come up, if you don't mind. Um, two things about this cornerstone. Some believe that it was like the keystone that held, like, the pieces together. You know, at the top of an arch, you'll have, like, a keystone. And some thought, well, the cornerstone was that. And others, and I would side with the others, who believe that chief, the cornerstone, was that big stone they would put at the foundation before they would build something that everything else was connected to and built off of, the chief cornerstone. And it's describing Jesus as that chief cornerstone. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So here's what we have. Together, redeemed and reconciled in Christ. It says, in him, in Christ, this whole building is joined together. There's that soon word again. We've been, this whole building is joined together and it rises to become this holy temple in the Lord. How? Together. Joined together. He doesn't stop there. Not only are we joined together to become more and more like Jesus, but look at this. He says, and in him, you too are being built together. So you are joined together to become a holy temple in the Lord and you are being built together, there's that soon word again, built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Church, you were a part and you were outside. We all were. And we were by nature children of wrath. 
but God who is rich in mercy and because of his great love bought us in, redeemed us, made us alive, raised us up, seated us in the heavenlies. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And he has joined us together and he is building us together into this beautiful thing that carries out the work of God. Make disciples. So if you're here this morning and you're still apart and outside, let me pick up one of these. Maybe, maybe this one has your name on it. And God is speaking to your heart today because you know you are outside and apart. And you heard today that God is rich in mercy and because of his great love, he sent Jesus to die for you so you could be bought in and brought together. It would be our prayer that you would make that decision this morning. Place your faith and trust in Jesus and what he did on a cross, breaking down all the barriers, and he himself is our peace. If you're a believer, here's, here's what I'm hoping we take away as believers. That remember where we once were. Remember what God did on our behalf. It's by grace we've been saved. There's no boasting. If you're going to boast about anything, boast about the Lord. Proverbs 27, 1 or 2 says, Let another man praise you, someone else, not your own lips. If we're boasting about anything, we're just saying, thank you, God. The last thing I want to leave you with is that there are people out here that God has brought into your life. That you might plant, that you might water, that you might spend time with, invest in, invite, that they might come to know God. We call it making disciples, reach, teach, and multiply. You go, how do we do that? How can I do that? If it's not just for pastors, if it's not just for leaders, how do I do it? And we have people meet here on a weekly basis to be inspired by the word and to lift up his name in praise and worship him. That's part of how we do it. The other thing we do is we meet together during the week, pray for one another, study the word together, and share our lives together. It wasn't like it was fancy. It's just what Jesus did. He got people together, consistently spent time with them in the Word, poured into them, and they grew to follow Him. And so we're asking you, here's what we're asking you, so we're clear. Like if you're not connected relationally to other people in the body, get connected. Like we'll help you. Reach out to Evan. We call them life groups. One life, one group, one neighborhood, one community at a time. Spending time in the Word together, praying together, lifting up one another, encouraging one another in the faith, so we might be bold in our faith. This morning, 1030, uh, our life group met out underneath this front entry. And we just gathered, there's probably about 15 of us, something like that. And we're praying for Sergio and Diana, because they're in our life group, and he has COVID, and struggling put pieces together and they have four boys we just hurt for them but can you imagine going through something like that and not having other people right there with you praying talking to you on the phone lifting you up reminding you what the word says and so we're called to do this stuff together and if you're living and doing life by yourself you're missing out but the body's missing out. And we're asking you to help us make disciples. We literally want to see God keep opening homes. People saying, I'll host, I'll lead, so we get more and more people connected, making disciples. We're literally watching people grow in their walks with Jesus right in front of us in living rooms, sitting on couches, sharing their stories, praying for one another. It's not rocket science. But it does take a step of faith on your behalf. 
out of your comfort and into the mission. Can I have you stand? We're going to take communion today.